editor of the online archive Ubu Web, and the editor of I'll Be Your Mirror, the selected Andy Warhol interviews, which is the basis for an opera called Trans Warhol, which premiered in Geneva. A pr an hour-long documentary on his work, Sucking on Words, Kenneth Goldsmith, premiered at the British Library in 2007. For many years, he was the host of a terrific weekly radio show on New York City's WFMU, and he teaches writing at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is the senior editor of Penn Sound, a remarkable poetry archive that I urge uh, you should all check it out, Penn Sound. Alison Knowles, in addition to being a poet, is a visual artist known for her sound works, installations, performances, publications, and association with Fluxus, the experimental avant-garde group formally founded in 1962. As one of the founding members of Fluxus, she produced what may be the earliest book object, a can of texts and beans called the Bean Rolls in 1963. In 1967, she produced the House of Dust poem, possibly the first computerized poem, 1967. Uh, she expanded the scale of her book projects with the big book, an eight foot tall book of environments organized around a spine. So you can see the kind of creativity that she brings to the project of making poems. So if uh, Alison Knowles and Kenneth Goldsmith would please come to the stage, we would love to hear from you. Is Jesse here? Hi, <laughs> hi. Say she has to go. I oh, okay, and my daughter into this wonderful house, and she made it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if I could just, I just received a signal um, that um, our first lady has to. Oh, doesn't have to go. Okay. <laughs> Carry on. I misread my signal. <laughs> All right. Okay, terrific. So, Kenny. I'm, I'm so glad you can stay. Um, I'd actually like to extend uh, what Billy and Rita said, but take it from a slightly different angle. Um, I'm actually interested, uh, for my students, I teach a class at the University of Pennsylvania called Uncreative Writing, where they are, are penalized for every, any shred of uh, creativity or originality that they show. As a matter of fact, these kids surreptitiously know so well how to uh, plagiarize, how to, how to, how to be fraudulent uh, by creating and copying, cutting and pasting, but it's always on the down low. In this class, I say, no, you must do that, and you must be accountable for those decisions that you're making. So, in other words, I want you to bring all that stuff that you're doing underground, I want you to bring it up to the surface, and you become accountable for what you're doing uh, and why you're doing it. What are the decisions that you're making? So one of the things that I first have them do is I have to, uh, I give them a very simple one. I say, retype five pages of your choice. Like, I leave them alone. Oh God, my parents are really wasting their money here at school. And they go home don't say anything else, and they kind of struggle with it, and what they come up with into class the next day, the next week, um, are all deeply personal, original pieces of writing without them having really written a word of it. Okay? So the question becomes, what did you choose to retype? And why did you choose to retype that? And you get wonderful personal stories. Uh, one girl said, well, I retyped uh, five pages of a short story that I thought was great when I was in high school. But now, having retyped it, I realize that it really isn't that great. Okay? So there's, there's more. Other students begin to realize that writing is a physical act. It's a bodily act. Because when you're doing something so dumb as retyping five pages, you start to notice the clamps in your eyes. You start to notice that your legs are Say that you need not try so hard. You 
what you are taking. Now, um, I say to my students, we may never have writer's block in my hands because the whole world deserves to play. Now, of course, we're all in the the entire works of Shakespeare and somehow manipulate it, represent it, and, 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 and justify those representations. This is an actual new tool that we have, and the web is for nothing but language, miles and miles and miles and miles of language. I never want to hear that you have writer's block with the cut and paste ability of, of, of the web. Please, you know, please, you can't say that. Um, so, with that said, I also, um, like to practice, uh, I've written 10 books of poetry and I haven't written a word of them. I'm a transcriber. I listen to things and I retype them. And that's exactly what you really said. Uh, I think the best way for our young writers to learn how to write is the way that our young writers learn how to write. You go up to the museum and you set your oil and canvases up in front of a, a Van Gogh or a Rembrandt and you replicate them. I was teaching at Princeton a couple of years ago, and one of the uh, students came up to me, and she was, very, she was studying with one of the most prominent fictional writers in America, and she was very frustrated because she was given an assignment to write a paper in the style of Jack Kerouac, and she said, you know, I really can't do that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Facebooking, and I'm chatting, and I'm, I'm doing this, this is, you know, how do I do that? Jack Kerouac's On the Road, she would have learned a lot more. Again, and, and, and you know, about Kerouac's style, why be imitative when you can actually uh, copy it directly? And I think actually this is, this is not so different from what you were saying. I just call it uncreative writing. And I think it's, we're really both getting at a way of different ends of what creative writing really means. Now, I'm just about to finish up, but I wanted to share with you some of my books. I am the most boring writer who has ever lived. I'm famous for that. My books bore me so badly. I can't read them. I fall asleep when I have to proofread them. Uh, they're, they're horrible. I can tell you, this is, a, this is a book called Day. And I retyped one day's paper uh, from the New York Times, from the very beginning of the paper to the very end. The stock pages alone, now of course they don't do stock pages anymore, the stock pages alone are 300 pages. It took me a year and a half to type, retype this newspaper. But I have to tell you, it was transcendent. It was beautiful. I mean, I looked forward to it. It was meditative. One of the most fabulous year and a half I've ever spent. And I came up with a 900-page book. Now, I want to just say that this is the greatest book that's ever been written. Of course, I didn't write a thing. I didn't write a word of it. But it's got love. It's got pathos. It's got war. It's got passion. It's got... Uh, Victory and defeat, you know, it's, it really is. This was, uh, uh, this was a very slow news day. It was the, it was the Friday of Labor Day in, in September, uh, in, 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 you know, for the, first, the Friday of Labor Day in, uh, in September of 2000. I mean, I picked a nothing day. I didn't want a dramatic day. I wanted a boring day because I'm a boring writer. But it really is, uh, I want to just say that, too, the newspaper is um, a novel every day. And it's written 900 times every day around the world, or 9,000 times, who even knows? And we throw it away and we write another novel the next day, culturally. I mean, this, is, this is fabulous literary production. This is real. And so you just simply take something and you reframe it, and um, it becomes literature. It's very easy. You're trying to 